One of the questions that came in was, what are my write-offs? What are my top 10 write-offs? Our Corey did that for you, Latasha, our, our, the accounting side of our business. We're gonna save you a, just a truck ton of money on your taxes. So my biggest fear is going to jail for not paying taxes. I was so terrified of that. Financial inclusivity is one of our values at our company. Some of our clients have seven figure incomes a year, right? Like in profit. You're cool. You have this awesome YouTube channel. Believe it or not, that's not the only reason that I've been working with Evolved Finance since 2021. And no, this is not an ad for their services, although certainly if you are in the market for a bookkeeper, be sure to check out their website. But what I really wanted to do with this episode was bring these resources, bring this knowledge to those of you who maybe are not at the point of hiring a bookkeeper yet or are not even sure what that means. And there's no shame in that because I was you just a few short years ago. I hired Evolved in May of 2021 after diversifying my revenue. A lot of my online courses started to really take off at that time. I started getting booked for speaking and more sponsorships and things like that. And it just became a little bit of a bigger beast, my money story, than I really properly knew how to handle on my own. So I am so excited to share this very important, part of my team with you in this episode. Parker, he knows my business finances probably more intimately than uh, almost anybody else. Uh, so this is a really candid and open conversation about freelance money. And I'm really excited to share it with you. I am, I think, Evolved Finance's biggest fan. Parker. <laughs> I feel like I annoy you guys. Honestly, I'm always, always shouting you out. I don't know if I ever told you this, but I think the first time you and I had a call, I'm pretty sure I cried after in a good way. So oh, <laughs> I, I say that this is one of the first cry stories I've heard. That's actually not just from anxiety before a call with me. So the fact it happened after because of relief is a first. And I wish I knew that because I would have included that in the book. Oh my gosh. I know. I felt so much clarity. You know, I felt I, I had hired different business coaches. I'd been obviously binging podcasts and reading books. And I just, the finance side was always something that was very intimidating to me, very scary. I think it is to a lot of people. Totally. And so I'm very excited to one, have you here with my audience. Uh, Cause I know you're going to bring a lot of clarity just on this podcast, but also can you talk about the book, the summit, um, which they're invited to check out as well? Yeah, absolutely. Well, first off, Latasha, you never bother us. Like you're cool. You have this awesome YouTube channel, right? Like you're allowed to bug us whenever you want. Cause you make me feel like a less of a, a numbers finance nerd, which I'm trying <laughs> to escape that as much as I can. Um, but I, uh, yes, I do have a book coming out in November, uh, called profit pillars. And this is like, if you're a freelancer, if you're an online business owner, like this is the book that would have answered all my questions back when I was working a corporate job. And I was like, God, I want to like start a business, but I don't know like, how did this, how does this stuff work? Like, what do I need to be thinking about? And a lot of those questions get answered in the book. It's really going to be like the handbook for online business owners and freelancers around how do I handle my money? But beyond just the book, we wanted to do something really special and unique because the, the really cool part about what I do, which is um, my business partner and I, uh, my business partner is Corey Whitaker. We run an accounting firm for online businesses. And, and one of the services we've offered since the very start is bookkeeping. So I've looked at the numbers of so many online businesses and I've developed relationships with those business owners over the years. I, I essentially went into my network and I called all my favors. I was like, y'all, we're gonna put together a summit as a bonus for anyone that pre-orders the book. The book is 30 bucks. The book alone is worth 30 bucks. I know it is. It's going to be, um, I think, a really, really helpful book for a lot of people. But the summit, the group of speakers we have like, Everything from financial mindset stuff to your money story to just profitability conversations that I think a lot of business owners don't really get to be part of because it's all about make money, make money, make money. And we have some people talking about how you boost revenue for sure, but also like how do we run more efficient businesses? How do we get an ROI from team expenses and hiring people? Like all these like more like real business conversations all in a week and the speakers we have are insane. Yeah. I feel like so many of these conversations are very hush hush. It's like, you have to know someone yes. who knows someone who wants yes. to really give you a, 
a, a peek into, you know, under the hood, if you will. The summit's going to be great. You're going to get to hear from all kinds of amazing people who are doing really amazing things in, in Including this space. Including Latasha, getting you Latasha's know. money story. It was <laughs> My, the Tuesday um, conversations, which Latasha is part of, day two, is all about money stories. And I think those are some of the most important conversations we have the whole week to hear from other like successful business owners. Like, how are you with money? Like, mm -hmm. how do you handle this part of your business? How did you learn about this part of your business? What were you good at? What were you bad at? I think it's going to be mm -hmm. one of the most relatable days for, for everyone that attends. And of course, Latasha crushed it. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay, well, let's get into some of the, I asked my audience for some questions. What finance, business, money questions do you have? Because I know they're tired of me saying, I'm not qualified to give you advice <laughs> or to give you an answer on that. Sure. Um, I can only share my own personal anecdotes. So I'm excited to have a real expert here to answer some of these questions. I think the, the biggest one uh, to start is just where to start with accounting. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you need to hire a bookkeeper? an accountant on day one? When should you DIY kind of managing your money? Can you talk mm -hmm. to that a little bit? Yeah, I think in the early stages, right, you're so concerned about just like, can I make money? Like, do I have a business? That you're not really thinking about that. But it all changes once you actually start seeing some funds deposit in your bank account because you sold something, whether it's a service, a digital product, whatever it may be. And that's when for a lot of newer business owners, you go, oh, I'm probably supposed to do something here, right? Like something financing, I should have some systems. So the first thing, and it's something we talk about in the book, um, it, we got to build a financial foundation for this business. And, and one of the easiest ways you can do that is you just got to separate your business and your personal finances, especially once you start to have money coming in. And all that means is we have to have financial accounts for our business, that are separate from our personal financial account. So that's things like your checking account, uh, savings account, if you're gonna use a credit card for your business. Um, and, and you don't even have to have them set up under your, a business name right off the bat, right? Like if your business is, is going and you wanna go create a business entity and make it like super official, then, then great. Uh, but even if not, even if you just have a personal checking account that's dedicated to your business, a personal credit card, that's dedicated to the business. Just your tax situation just got more complicated by starting a business. So anything you can do to separate those business, the business income and the business transactions so you or someone else can kind of track that for you. So when it comes time for taxes, you can go, hey, accountant, look at this is just my business inco income. This is just my business expenses. You're not sifting through my shopping and my groceries and all the other personal things that I'm spending money on that has nothing to do with my business. Um, that's huge, right? Because mm -hmm. now as a business owner, even if you're just making a modest amount of money, you have extra responsibilities, which is I got your taxes are going to be different than when you were just a W-2 payroll employee working for someone else. But the other thing here that I think is just really important is there is a transition we all have to go through. And I think this is why, Latasha, you know, you talked about just feeling so relieved when you found us at Evolve Finance and you were able to kind of relax around this is there is a need to think about your business as something separate from yourself, right? When we have our finances all mixed together, like you're not going to go to jail for like having everything there. It's just going to be messy and unorganized. But I think from a mental standpoint, showing a commitment to like, I'm going to make this business thing work. This is not, this is not my personal income. This is my business's income until I make the decision to move money from my business into my personal account. Because when you have a business, you're hopefully going to have a business checking account. Money comes in. You use that money to pay for business expenses and whatever is left over, which is going to be your profit. Then you can decide how much of that profit you can transfer over to yourself as a business owner. But what happens is when it's all mixed together, well, what's really the profit? Well, I also got my paycheck from my full-time job because I'm a part-time freelancer or a part-time business owner. It's, it's just kind of a side hustle thing. Well, then there's a lack of financial clarity there that makes it harder to go, well, how do I set my personal budget? And also makes it hard to go, well, how do I set my business's budget and really understand what I'm spending money on? So yes, some of this is like, let's stay organized so our accountants don't hate us and can actually file our taxes accurately and appropriately. But also as a business owner, like let's make sure I have clarity into what do I need to be doing with my personal finances versus what do I need to be doing with my business's finances? So we're making good decisions for each part of our financial lives. 
Yeah, yeah. There was a specific question that I want to ask you uh, that I think a lot of people can relate to. This person has a retail LLC and they're looking to get into marketing services and content creation. Would the recommendation there be to sep- create a separate account for those things as well, retail business versus marketing or content creation, or combine them all under one LLC? So this is a, this is the kind of question where um, I just want to say right off the bat, there's no perfect solution here, right? Mm-hmm. A lot of what business is, is a lot of baby steps that most entrepreneurs just wanted, like take leaps, even in my corporate experience, like my corporate career, I wanted to like, I had big ideas and I wanted to help the company. And it's like, I had a couple mentors that were like, cool. How do we prove this? How do we take some steps? So in a situation like this, you know, if you're serve, if you don't even have a client yet or a customer yet to create a whole new business entity or like all new bank accounts for like a business that you're not even sure if it's going to get off the ground, it's probably going to be a lot of work and a lot of effort that may go to waste. Mm-hmm. Um, so in my mind, I'm like, start off just using the same accounts. And if the service starts to pick up, then yes, I think eventually you do want to separate that out, especially because you're talking about two very different businesses, right? We're talking about two businesses, which I would even I have a lot of questions to the person who asked yeah. that about that. And if that's the right move to be doing anyways, but then it's like, yes, you have kind of like a liability situation where because your retail business is so much different than your marketing services business, your business that you just don't want like an issue with a retail customer to cause a legal issue with now your other business, like right. separating those things out eventually will probably be the right call. But until we have like this second business really proven and the marketing services take off, then just use the same accounts, test it out as things get momentum. And here's the thing. I, I didn't really, I realized I didn't really fully answer your first question, Latasha is um, bookkeeping. If you have yeah. good bookkeeping, you can separate the revenue out. You can even separate some of those expenses out and get an idea of like, all right, how much money is coming from the retail business versus how much money is coming from the service? What am I yeah. spending on different expenses for those two different businesses? Eventually, yes. Like if there's a lot of financial activity, I'd want two separate sets of books. I don't want that mm-hmm. all in one set of books. So that's where eventually we want to get to that separation. But that's also where bookkeeping can help just organize this without having to like, do a mm-hmm. bunch of legwork to create another business entity, open new bank accounts, do all this stuff that is still time consuming, will probably cost you some money to do so, all just to see if this other business is going to work. That's mm-hmm. where like you just have good bookkeeping to begin with, even if you're doing it yourself, then you can get the visibility into both businesses and then you'll have a better sense of when is the right time to actually open that new account open up that new business entity and and make the separation between your books. But when we were talking before, the right time to get a bookkeeper uh, is really going to be dependent on the size of your business and um, the financial complexity of your business. I just recommend in the early stages, do your bookkeeping in a spreadsheet. Again, that might feel like a project where you're like, well, how do I do that? Well, just wait and we'll have a spreadsheet for you eventually when our book comes out in November. But I, I don't recommend that that small business owners try to figure out QuickBooks or try to use Zero. There's a lot of bookkeeping principles you have to understand, like accounting principles you have to understand in order to utilize software like that properly. And business owners, 99% of the time are going to make a bigger mess of yeah. that bookkeeping software than actually help them gain more financial insight. There's just like a thousand different ways you can screw things up mm-hmm. while also thinking you're doing everything right. So yeah. that's where I think a spreadsheet in the early stages is all you need to do. I still also use a spreadsheet. I still keep my own. It's not as detailed as what you all do for me, but just as a quick day-to-day, like at a glance, yeah. I kind of am able to keep an eye on things myself too. So uh, another big question, a lot of people ask this, uh, what do I do with my money? <laughs> what, what do you do with your money <laughs> once you make it? We all know, okay, we're supposed to make money in the business. This is another area. So my biggest fear is going to jail for not paying taxes. I was so terrified of that. Um, and uh, I feel a lot better about it now that I have other eyes on my on my books. I but... think you're safe, Latasha. Yeah, I do think you're you. safe. Thank you're you. going to be okay. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, we all know we're supposed to pay, pay taxes, right? So outside of that, saving for taxes, what do you do with the revenue in your business? How do you decide what to pay yourself? How do you decide how much you can ex- you know, expense and spend on things? Where do so we start? again... 
<laughs> very unsatisfying answer, right? There's there's a there's a lot of different options here. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the the core piece to this, because here's the thing, when you become a business owner, you're an executive, right? And, the, and kind of the root of the idea of like, even you think about executive functioning of the brain, it's decision making, right? You as the executive of your business ha have all this input, all this data, and you have to make decisions, right? Even as something as small as like, how do I answer a customer service email to a, a frustrated customer? Like you're making a gazillion different decisions. Yep. Um, and so a big part of being a business owner is, well, I, how can I make better decisions? And usually you make better decisions by getting more information, right? So you can see the full picture of what's going on and then you can make the most informed decision you can you know, hopefully most of the time it's the right one. Sometimes it's not going to be, and that's okay. And hopefully you get input and feedback that helps you to make that decision better in the future. And so when it comes to, uh, you know, making a decision, like, well, what do I do with my money? It's like, well, do you have financial visibility into that? Because mm -hmm. so much of the answer to that is going to be like in your books, right? Mm -hmm. So um, maybe you have a loan sitting in your business, right? Well, your books are going to be able to show you, well, I think we need to pay off that loan because the interest is really high. And, and so we got to pay that off. Or maybe um, you're sitting on some money uh, and maybe that money just needs to sit in the business. Because for instance, at Evolve Finance, our, our, our bookkeeping service, we recommend our clients save three months of operating expenses. So instead of going out and buying like a new car, it might be, hey, to stabilize this business, I need to just leave this cash here because not every month is going to be a good month. Sometimes, yep. you know, global pandemics happen and we're like, what the hell is going to happen with my business? Um, yeah. So having that extra cash in the business is great. Maybe you have way more cash than you need for three months of savings. And there is a big bonus that you need to take, or maybe you just need to increase your monthly salary because mm -hmm. um, maybe you've barely been paying yourself at all. And so it's like, all right, it's time to, time to increase my monthly pay. You know, there's just so many different scenarios. Cause then if you do, if you are super profitable and you don't know what to do with the money, then it's like, cool, go find a financial advisor and like start investing in mm -hmm. retirement accounts. A lot of the times your accountant can not only help you save on taxes, but also put tax strategies in place in your business that will actually benefit you personally by putting money into 401ks or Roth mm -hmm. or into IRAs or uh, whatever it may be. So there are a multitude of things you can do. And also sometimes you can just invest the money back into your business because one of the best investments you can make is back into your business to help it grow so you can make even more profit down the road. The only way you really know what's right for you is you just need financial visibility. And the way mm -hmm. you have financial visibility is it starts with bookkeeping. It's something I talk about uh, in my book, Profit Pillars. If your finances aren't organized, if you're not getting any financial reporting, if you're not tracking what's going on in your business, then these decisions feel absolutely impossible. Can you explain the concepts of write-offs? Because I have a bit of a, I could go on a rant about this. Oh yeah. I'm sure you probably can too. I think people think on the internet when I, when you say, oh, I wrote this off that it's like free. Like, oh, I wrote off this computer, so I got this computer for free. Can you explain um, what that means when people say they write something off? <laughs> First off, if you want a great meme to post on Instagram, Latasha, um, yeah. David, from the character from Schitt's Creek, mm. talks about write-offs. There's this brilliant meme. It's a whole episode. Uh, he becomes an entrepreneur. As a, uh, he's this character, and he just starts writing everything off because yes. he thinks he knows what a write-off is, but he's not, and he's just spending all his money, and his dad's like, yes. what are you doing? It's hilarious. Mm -hmm. But there is, I think, a little bit of, uh, there's confusion here. And I think, unfortunately, with TikTok and Instagram, there's a lot of people who um, are only kind of giving you half the reality of what it means to do that. Yeah. Like, oh, just go get a, a G-Wagon because then, <laughs> you know, you can write it off. Yeah. It's true. You can write that off, but that doesn't mean it's financially prudent. So yeah. I think the, the most important thing to say here first, Latasha, is that our most successful most profitable clients have the biggest tax bills. Mm. It's just the reality. I know mm -hmm. we hear about like huge corporations and like these, you know, multi multi millionaire or billionaires who are like avoiding their tax, their taxes. Cool. Like they literally have a team of accountants and lawyers who are doing everything they can to, to save the money. Hence putting money overseas to Swiss bank, you know, all the kind yeah. of like cliche rich people, strategies yep. we hear about. 
But for like our clients, which some of our clients have seven figure incomes a year, right? Like in profit, mm-hmm. seven figure, that's not that much money in the grand scheme of things. They pay taxes on it. Yeah. They're not paying the maximum amount. They're putting tax strategies into place. But at the end of the day, they build their wealth from being profitable. So when you write off an expense through your business, what you're doing is saying, I'm going to give up profit in order to, uh, to pay for a business expense. And so if the business expense is necessary for your business to operate, then great. That's the cost of doing business. But the confusion comes into play where it's like, well, there are tax strategies that will show up as expenses in your business, but will kind of benefit you, right? Like having a G ride benefits you because you get to roll around in a Mercedes that you you kind of paid for tax free, so to speak, right? Like the business Mm -hmm. paid for this and it reduced your tax bill. But if your business now has no cash because you had to put $150,000 $150,000 into purchasing a G ride. So you could avoid, I don't know, yeah. $30,000 in taxes. Your business is worth worse off. And so are you, unless you're like in a situation where that G ride is a drop in the bucket for you. And it's just yeah. like, yeah, I need a car. I can afford the gas. I can afford the shirt insurance. I'm still got plenty of profit that I'm going to pay taxes on. Then great. Mm-hmm. But the, the whole point of running a business is to have as few write-offs as possible, like business expenses, so we can be as profitable as we can. So if we are going to be reducing our profitability with tax strategies, then we better be so profitable that even once we put those tax strategies into place, we still have plenty of cash to make sure we have three months of savings saved up in the business. We still have cash to um, invest back into the business. And we still have the cash we need to make sure we're paying ourselves a consistent salary every single month. If you're paying $0 in taxes and you're not a billionaire, that's not likely very good. Like chances are that's not good for you. Unless Mm -hmm. you have a spouse who's making a ton of money and your business is just there to fund your 401k, right? There are very unique situations where it's like, my business doesn't need to be profitable, but that's because you're already privileged and you have money coming in somewhere else. But when you're the breadwinner for your family, when you're relying on your business for an income, yes, of course, write off your business expenses if they're appropriate, but don't just go spend money on stuff just because you can, because you're lowering your profitability and your profit's going to be how you do invest into retirement, how you do save up for to buy real estate. It, it's how it's going to, you're going to pay your bills personally. And if you're spending so much money in your business, writing off stupid crap you don't need, then you're yeah. just throwing money away in order to save money on taxes. Yeah. You're still spending money. I think that's what yeah. I had to learn is like, no, this is not, this is not free. This is still coming out of your account. If you bought a thousand dollar computer, that's still a thousand dollars out of your business. And, um, I think I'll quote the, I think this is the IRS definition, ordinary and necessary, right? Expenses, mm-hmm. something like that. Can you give, uh, an example? Uh, so one of the questions that came in was what are my write-offs? What are my top mm-hmm. 10 write-offs? So can you get a, give an example of, you know, somebody with a business like mine, an online course creation business, mm-hmm. a content creation business, a freelance marketer, like what are some things that Generally speaking, obviously it depends person to person, but what are some common expenses maybe that you see people writing off? Sure. Um, The general stuff is going to be like, if you're using software for your business, easy write off that that's what we want to like. Those are the types of business expenses we want running through our business checking account or running through our business credit card, right? If you're paying a contractor on Mm -hmm. Upwork, Mm -hmm. that's a business expense as long as they're working on things in your business. Any labor expenses, really contractors that you're hiring out, all your software, there's uh, even like, this is where an accountant is really helpful. And and honestly, I think everyone needs an accountant before even a bookkeeper because your accountant is ultimately going to decide how much of certain things you're gonna write off, but you get into things like writing off a portion of your internet, your home Mm -hmm. internet for your business, uh, your cell phone, uh, computer, buying a computer, buying podcast equipment, buying video equipment for your business. There's all these things that, um, again, I think it's logical. It makes sense. These are the things I think where people get tripped up is, okay, what are the secret things I should, yeah. <laughs> that I get to write off? It's like, there's no secret things. If your business needs it, 
then pay for it. But the idea here is that you actually want to pay for as few things as possible because that means you're running an efficient business. And that's why the internet is brilliant, right? Latasha, like, yeah, you didn't have to buy an office space to get your business mm -hmm. started, right? You didn't yeah. have to buy a crap load of inventory to get your yep. business started. You didn't have to um, purchase a ton of equipment, like, mm -hmm. like a manufacturer, manufacturing business. Yeah. It's just like, I'm going to create a website. And I'm just going to start doing things for people and see where it goes. Right. I know I'm over some yeah. but like, I mean, there's very little yeah. overhead. Absolutely. Yeah. And I still don't, I still don't have an office space outside of my home. I still, no. you know, it, it's pretty lean and it, and that's the cool thing about online businesses. My business can be leaner too, if I need to, you know, there are subscriptions that I probably could get that are nice to have maybe, uh, True. but I could get rid of if I really needed to just have a simple payment processor and you know, that's it. You really shouldn't have that many expenses. Like you want to write off legitimate stuff, but, um, profitability is the name of the game. So out of all finance, we want our clients to be keeping at least 30% of yeah. every dollar they make. So 30 cents for every dollar we want them keeping. And a lot of our clients are keeping like half of their revenue. So if they did $250,000, let's say in revenue, it would not be uncommon for me to see a client keep 40 or 50% of that as profit and still even having some like owner benefit expenses, these types of, these types of write-offs that kind of benefit them too, like writing off some of their internet, things that they would pay for normally that are also business related. So like, this is what we're dealing with here. Like these mm -hmm. businesses where we don't have to take out loans to get them started. We've had seven figure clients, business clients that have a uh, multi-million dollar year businesses in terms of their revenue, in terms of how much sales they generate, who keep mm -hmm. like 60 to 70% of that as profit. Yeah. These are the kinds of businesses that like could be going out and looking for business write-offs, Every single right? write-off, yeah. But they know that's not the game. The game is mm -hmm. let's get this business as profitable as it can. And then my accountant will help me find the ways to write things off that I'm not going to know about, right? I know our Corey did that for you, Latasha, our, our, the accounting side mm -hmm. of our business. There was a lot of things that like our team's like, you're not supposed to know about this, but we do, but we're going to save you a, just a truck ton of money on your taxes because you're making mm -hmm. enough profit that we can do this, right? Because you're not spending all your money on dumb stuff just to try to avoid taxes that now we can not only save you money on taxes, but we can also, some of those tax savings will actually benefit you and, and put into uh, wealth building yeah. vehicles for your yourself, right? And not like a Mercedes vehicle, but like, Yes. Like an actual 401k. Yes, exactly. Yeah. You're going to hate me for this question, but I just have to ask it. Cause I think it's, I think it's relevant to a lot of people who okay. watch and listen, do nails count as a, uh, <laughs> business, ex you know, if, if you're a content creator or somebody like me, you know, um, I've had people give me this advice before too. They're like, you pay for your clothes. I'm like, I don't know. I just do. i never really thought that much about it. I'm on camera multiple times a week, you know, wardrobe nails, d is there ever a situation where that does count as a business expense or is that a general no? For most people, it's going to be a no. Um, yeah. But that doesn't mean it's a no for everybody. So here's, yeah. here's the lesson I want everyone to understand. The larger the business you have, the more you can tuck away these gray area business write-offs because your tax bill is already going to be so juicy that the IRS is not worried about your, you know, $50 nail excursion, right? Like, uh, cause your accountant likely is like, we can justify it. Doesn't mean the IRS would accept it, but the IRS isn't worried about that. But if your business, you're in your third year of not turning a profit because you're spending all your money on nails and clothes, guess what? You're going to get a red flag and you're going to get audited. And they're going to be like, your business is bull crap. Yeah. And now you got to pay tax. You're going to pay back taxes on all this stuff. That's not a legitimate business expense, but I do want to give, this is where I think having a, an accountant that understands what your business is, is really important. So we had a client who is a, who's a YouTube influencer, uh, was in fashion, did a lot of, um, like lookbook kind of stuff. And, uh, mm -hmm. and their whole, their whole content was around like purchasing clothes and, showing different ways to put those clothes together for people to like, just like who are, who are into style and fashion. So yeah, the 
the tax code is very clear. The only way you're writing off like clothes is if you have uniforms, right? Like if you were a security company and you have to buy all your security people, like their security yeah. uniforms. Yeah, you get to write that off. It's a uniform. It's not like these people are like, oh, I can't wait to go wear my security clothes on the weekend for fun, right? It's it's not fashion. Right. It's it's a it's a uniform or nurses' outfits and things yeah. like that. But a lot of this tax code was written well before the internet. So yep. this client, client's accountant, didn't go well. No, you can't write off any of the clothes you're buying for your YouTube videos. They understood the business model that she had. It's almost like more like um a production company, right? Like in the entertainment industry, right. who's making TV shows or movies, you're, you're going, yeah, like the whole point of making your videos, which these videos are making you money on YouTube through mm -hmm. sponsorships. And, and then the little amount YouTube gives you, um, for views. Yep. The only reason you're making those videos is because of the clothes you're buying. Of course, we're going to write off these clothes. It's literally yep. the focus of your content. So that's where nuance matters yep. here, right? Latasha, where it's like, does your account understand your business model, how you make money? Because then your account's not going to be nervous about writing that off. They're going to, if they were audited, they could tell the auditor, look, this isn't, they're not buying clothes for the fun of it. Look at all these videos where they're modeling these clothes. It's different though, when you're like, well, I'm going to give a presentation next week. And so I'm going to buy a new outfit. The IRS is not going to agree with you on that. They're just not. And unless you're making so much dang money, that if you did write it off, it's going to make almost no impact on your taxes. The smaller your business is, the less you want to be pushing that envelope because uh, you want to show the IRS that your business is viable and you're not writing off things you shouldn't and, um, and you're paying your appropriate amount of taxes. I'm not a professional, but my thoughts on this are, yeah, if you're, if you're writing off your nails every week, but you're not making money, that's a red flag. Like that, the, the IRS... That's going to stick out to the IRS. Um, to your point, yes, if your career is in entertainment, or I think that's where we we hear about some of these things of, oh, you can just write off your entire wardrobe, Latasha. I'm yeah. not Oprah. You know, like it's I think it's a little different. And also something, I don't know if this is good or bad advice. I don't even know where I read it, but I don't write off my wardrobe because I 99% of the clothes I wear in my YouTube videos are clothes I wear in my everyday life as well. They're not yeah. bought just for my YouTube video. Again, I think it'd be different if I was making a movie and I was buying a, an elaborate costume yes. uh, or even for a YouTube video, if it was an elaborate costume just for that video, that would probably be a different situation than me wearing this t-shirt that I'm going to wear in a podcast, but I'll also wear out to the mall later. You know, I, I've, I've, I'm not on camera as much as you, Latasha, but I've been on <laughs> plenty of videos and I've done live speaking and I've never I've never written off clothes because it's just, that's not what yep. the, the law says. But again, if you were making videos about the clothes you were purchasing now, now we're talking, a, yep. like we're talking about a write-off there, but this is where I think, especially when you get into like the influencer space, there is a yeah. gray area between where does my business start and my life end? It's all really mixed together. And that's where making sure your accountant kind of understands what your business model is and you're being honest about what really is necessary for your business versus what's not. I, I think that's, uh, that's a realm of, a, or a business model where it can get a little murky. But again, if you're writing all this stuff off and you have no money to show for it, you might want to think about writing off less of that. So you can invest some more money into your business in a way that actually helps. So you can hopefully make enough money that you don't have to worry about that stuff. Yeah, perfect. I want to ask a question about scaling. Uh, this question came in from one of my friends. I know her situation quite well. Um, but I just if we can speak to this a little bit generally, she asked a funny question. She said, will you ask them if it's an awful idea to hire a part time employee? LOL. Um, and you know, her and I have talked about this a little bit. Again, obviously, it's situational, but totally, when should somebody start kind of thinking about hiring a full time or a part time employee versus a contractor? when they're looking to scale. Well, and I think this is going to be probably pretty typical for like a lot of freelancers in your, your audience, Latasha, right? If, if they're getting really busy and they're like, how am I going to get all this work done? Then you, you got to start thinking about bringing other people in. And I think the first step is usually going to be like hiring a contractor part-time. So when we, when we think about employees versus contractors, I think the first thing we have to understand is there are some laws especially like California and New York are really strict about this. 
Um, sometimes you're not allowed to hire a contractor to do certain work. If it's like, yeah, this is a 40 hour a day job and you're going to be doing stuff critical to the business, man managing the daily operations of the business, and you're not going to have any other clients, like you don't get to hire them as a contractor, nor do I think that's actually what's best for your business. But I just want to make sure everyone understands here. Like this is where like having a, a business lawyer to talk yeah. through some of this stuff with about the specific situation you're in with your team is huge. Yeah. That said legally like protecting my own butt here aside contractors i think are awesome for project based work and i know for a lot of marketing agencies an agency is essentially that i'm bringing together a group of contractors giving them work to get done i project manage them we get the work done for the client and hopefully i'll have lots of new client uh, lots more clients where i can give these contractors regular work when you start to get into the daily operations of a business that's where I think employees are just way better. So let's first just talk the financials of it. So at least in the US, a contractor is really not that much cheaper than an employee. The reason employees are a little scarier is they're usually about seven to 8% more expensive, mm -hmm. which isn't really that big of a deal. But now you gotta mm -hmm. get payroll software and, and pay them a monthly salary through payroll. Gusto's amazing, JustWorks is amazing. Customer service around payroll has gotten so much better. And there's even accountants that can help you set that stuff up and at least get you started. So I just don't want that to be an excuse. An employee is slightly more expensive, but if there's someone that's crucial to what you do, like all of our bookkeepers on, on, in our bookkeeping service at Evolve Finance are full-time US-based employees because mm -hmm. we want to deliver a consistent experience for our clients. We don't want turnover. We want to develop talent in our business because our bookkeepers are the ones who eventually become our account managers who we promote to account managers, right? Like this is the core function of our business is yep. delivering bookkeeping services and, and accounting services to our clients. But like we redid our website at the start of the year. I'm not going to hire a full-time web designer. We worked with a, right. uh, an agency that did an awesome job. Uh, shout out to Fierce Creative. It was a temporary project. So we paid them as a contractor. So in the early stages of our business, sure, a VA, like an overseas VA, we pay as a contractor. Of course. Mm -hmm. But as our businesses get bigger and we need other people to start showing up daily yeah. in our businesses to like really manage critical parts of the business, then it's like, I think the employees are just so much, assuming you can legally have a contractor instead of an employee, I'd still take an employee, even if it's legal mm -hmm. for them to do it as a contractor, because you want to start feeling like there's other people in the business with you supporting it. So you don't feel so alone. People who are, have a vested interest in the business being successful, you can start to build a team. You can start to build a culture in your business. Even if it's just three of you, yeah. that's still, there's a vibe there that you get to create that when you have a contractor, it's just not the same. And there becomes a point where you're like, well, how important is it that you don't just have turnover in this position all the time because the contractor goes, eh, I got a better job or eh, I don't want to do this anymore or whatever. And you have all this volatility. Employees are different. It's a little, you're both making a bigger commitment to each other, but also as a business owner, you have to know when it's time to make a commitment to your business and go like, I need people I can rely on to scale. So I think a lot of this is sure. Some people are scared of the cost. Well, it's going to be a little more expensive. Okay. But really what it comes down to is just committing to another human coming into the business and really like caring, like they're going to put your business down on their resume for their next job. Like that's a different level of commitment than a contractor. That's like, you're another client. And if I don't like you, then I'm just going to go somewhere else. So contractors are great for websites. Social media managers can be great. Um, you get into like Facebook ads, marketing services, things like that, copywriting. Like there are businesses, there are these services that I'm like, yeah, unless you have a really unique situation, you're probably never going to bring someone on as an employee for any of those things. But anything kind of do, to do with like customer service and operations and delivery to your clients or customers, like these types of roles, um, that's when you want to start thinking about uh, maybe bringing on an employee instead of a contractor. Awesome. So helpful. Okay. I've got one last question for you. Uh, a lot of people ask me about pricing and you mm -hmm. have the honor, I think of working with so many really smart business owners. Is there something that 
you think they all have in common when it comes to pricing? It's funny, Latasha. I was going to have a whole chapter on this in the book. And I, I put together this, this whole book proposal where I talked about what I was going to talk about in each chapter. And so in my proposal uh, to my publisher, I was like, this chapter is all about pricing. I laid it all out. And then when it came time to write the chapter, which it was like one of the last ones, and I already wrote so much and I'm like, we're going to have to cut some stuff. I'm like, this is like a whole other book. Like pricing is going to oh, be yeah. a whole other book because there's a lot of nuance and a lot of strategy behind this. But yeah. the one thing I think, like if I'm going to give everyone a little bit of uh, my perspective on pricing, um, there's, there is a lot of bad advice about pricing. Pricing has a lot to do with how well you understand the value of what you deliver, as well as how much handholding or effort you're putting into delivering on a promise. So let's first talk about the value of an offer. So we have clients who have built seven figure businesses around teaching something like guitar. They have like a community, a membership teaching you how to play guitar. They built a seven figure business around that. But the, um, the average value per client, um, is not as high as let's say um, one of our clients who sells like a $15,000 a year coaching program, right? Mm -hmm. They're going to have way less clients selling a $15,000 offer, but they don't have to have as many to build a seven figure business. And also an offer where you're like, Hey, I'm going to teach you how to make more money. There's a clear return on investment there, which is why business offers can be so sexy. Cause it's like, pay me $10,000 and I'll teach you how to make 50 or a hundred or a million, right? So you're like, okay, the ROI on that's insane. Let's go. Yeah. But how do you put value on like getting better at guitar? Right. That that's that now you're getting into like your copywriting, your messaging, how good your teaching framework is. Are you really teaching people to play guitar faster? Like to learn faster, the value of learning how to play an instrument or learning how to quilt or, you know, whatever, like a hobby the value of that is likely going to be a lot lower than solving a health problem, solving mm -hmm. a business problem, right? There, there's certain things where the pain of that problem is more severe. So people are willing to pay more to solve that problem. And that's why like entertainment, for instance, like I have a baseball podcast I love. It's uh, mm -hmm. specifically for the Padres, shout out Padres Hot Tub. <laughs> and I pay $50 a year to be entertained by them. They have like a community and stuff and they have some private podcasts you get access to that's not on their normal feed. So like entertainment is, is, is also like there's value to it, but you're probably not going to charge $15,000 a year for like something of entertainment. There's going to be very few entertainment um, products out there that you're going to pay that much money for. So I think that's the first thing we have to understand is what's the value of the problem we're solving and what kind of like, what are other people charging to solve that problem mm -hmm. in other ways? But then the other thing that's going to affect your price is, well, how involved are you going to be? So we, we had a client that, uh, or we have a client that teaches piano. They have a bunch of YouTube videos that drives people to their course. The course is super affordable. It runs like clockwork and it's just, you know, not a lot of effort there. There's no community that they're mm -hmm. paying into. There's no private one-on-one -on -one lessons. It's like, here's the course, go through it. And you're going to learn how to play piano better. But you, once you buy it, we're done. It's going to charge a lower price for that, right? Because it's, it's, it's very low, low effort on his part. There's not one-on-one -on -one attention. So probably going to need to charge less than if it was like, Hey, I'm going to sit down with you. I'm going to fly to your house and I'm going to teach you how to play piano. And we're going to sit there for a week and do nothing. I'm going to make sure you learn how to play piano. You'd probably have to charge a crap load of money for that in a way no one's going to want to pay. Like, I don't want to learn yeah. how to play piano that much, dude. You don't need to fly out to my house. I'm good. So, but on business offers, right? Well, should I have a membership or should I do one-on-one -on -one coaching or should I sell a course? Well, the type of offer you're, you're selling is going to have a different value. And so typically the types of offers you can spend or you can price higher, usually there needs to be a, a higher touch component to it. There's more involvement. You're going to get group calls or one-on-one -on -one calls. I mean, even mm -hmm. think about our service at Evolve Finance, right? It's, we're not teaching you how to do your own books. You literally have a team of people that is getting it done every week, answering your questions, solving problems. So, you know, on average, our clients, I think are paying us $5,000 a year for that. Yep. So 
that's what we have to understand. And that's where if you circle back, probably to a lot of things you teach, Latasha, right? Where you start to get into, well, who's your target market? Mm -hmm. What's the problem that we want to solve for them? How are we going to solve that problem for them? These are the things that can kind of help help us gain some clarity around our pricing. But at the end of the day, chances are your initial pricing, you're not going to nail it. Lord knows out of all finance, we did way more for our clients and charged way less for it until we realized, oh, if we want our business to function, we got to focus on the things that offer the most value and solve the biggest problems for our client. And we have to charge more for that value. And the way we charge more for that value is making sure we're delivering on the promises we're making and and so on and so forth. Yep. So I do think pricing is something that evolves over time. So I just want everyone to have, you know, a little bit of a leeway here to know that you might be adjusting your pricing at different stages in your business. But if you want to stay in the ballpark of where you should be, then we need to understand what's the value of the problem we're solving and then how much effort is being put into helping them to solve that problem. Like how much are we paying to support, like with business expenses to, uh, to support people with solving that problem. Does that make sense? Absolutely. I love it. So helpful. Thank you so much, Parker, for your time. You dropped so many great knowledge gems to us and we're going to have more at the summit. So again, I will have that link for the book in the, the landing page for the summit, pre-order the book, you get free access to the summit. Um, I'll also put just the regular Evolve Finance link if anyone wants to check that out and is interested in that part of the business, but any final words, where can people find you outside of those places? Yeah. I mean, we are uh, kicking up our Instagram game. There's not a lot of accounting firms who create as much content as we do. Um, we do a lot of shorts on YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, stuff like that. Trying to financial inclusivity is one of our values at our company. We have three values and financial inclusivity is one of them. We are big believers in share, doing things like this, Latasha, right? Like just sharing financial information with people so people can become more financially literate, more confident around this stuff. So um, we, we definitely take that to heart with uh, the content we create. And again, the book is 30 bucks and it's literally my life's work of everything our clients have spent thousands of dollars for us to teach them and show them. And it's all there in that book. And then like you said, the summit's just gonna be icing on the cake on top of that. If you enjoyed this conversation, you're gonna love the summit because we go even deeper into all these different aspects of running a business and how it affects our profitability. Yeah. I'm truly so excited for the book. I I've been excited for the book as soon as you told me about it, just because so much of my audience is brand new there or, or they haven't even started their business yet, you know? So they're not at the point where they're ready to hire a bookkeeper, an accountant, but this is the book that I wish I could give them and I will be giving them and I will be recommending to them. He's grabbing the book now. Um, I can't believe yeah, I didn't have this, Latasha. <laughs> I need to have yes. it right at my desk. Yes. So it's back. It might be backwards. I don't know if it's going to be backwards or not, but here we are. That's the book. And we great. actually have yes. pre, pre-sale copies. So it actually exists, Amazing. I promise. There's a real book out there. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you so much, Parker. Appreciate you as always. And I'll talk to you soon. Thank you, Latasha. Thanks, everyone. All right, y'all, I'm going to put it in your ear one more time, you guys. This book, I cannot recommend it more. I wish that I had this book when I started my business. Everything about the money stuff just freaked me out. It scared me so, so much, and it doesn't have to be scary. The whole team at Evolve Finance has seriously broken money down to me in such an understandable, approachable, not scary way. And I know this book is going to help you. It will probably be the best $30 that you spend uh, at least this month, but maybe this year. I will have a link for that down below. And you get the summit. You get access to the summit. I'm really proud of the interview that I did. It was a really fun chat. It was very honestly kind of like therapy. So if you want to get inside my head a little bit in my life story, uh, you'll love it. So thank you so much to Parker for joining me. Thank you so much to you for listening. And I'll have all those links down in the description and show notes for you down below. Have a great day. I'll talk to you next time. Bye.